So I'm thankful today that uh, I've been given this opportunity to share on the letters of Paul. Now, when you think of the letters of Paul, um, a lot of times people have uh, the image of Paul as this old man, maybe in prison, teaching and writing the Bible, <laughs> or writing the letters that were put into the Bible. And we have this, this is a painting by, by Rembrandt. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, this is a big painting way how he pictured the Apostle Paul, of course, this is not, this is not a selfie. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, just a painting of someone's imagination. But we have this picture of the Apostle Paul as this man who wrote this, the scripture, and he was an old man. But, um, you know, the Bible says that, that um, I think one of the things that, that I, th I feel very encouraged by as I, as, as I studied for this, one of the things that moved me the most was thinking about the great conversion. The Apostle Paul says, this saying is trustworthy. This is in one of his last books, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And in the New King James, or the King James, it says, of whom I am the chief. The leading sinner is what he was saying. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. So when, when we think of... Paul's conversion, we got to think back to a little bit, and if you got your Bibles with you, I'd, I'd encourage you to go to Acts chapter 7, and we're just going to pull a couple scriptures out of the story, I don't have time to read all the stories, but uh, in Acts 7 you have the story of, the, of Stephen, the stoning of Stephen, who was, a, was preaching the gospel, and the people got riled up, and they, they, they started killing him, they're throwing rocks at him, and if you look at verse 58, Acts 7, 58, it says, Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So that's our first introduction to Saul. There's this young man, not this old man, this young man holding the coats of those who were killing the, 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 the Stephen, one of the early preachers. And in chapter 8, Acts 8, verse 1, it says, Saul approved of the execution. And verse 3 of that, Acts 8, 3, I'm jumping around a little bit, but it says, But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So you have this picture of this young man all, all gung-ho to, to get after Christians. And, you know, when you think of, you know, we hear these stories in the Middle East, uh, ISIS and... Um, different groups that are persecuting and killing Christians. Well, Paul was almost at that level that he approved of the execution of, of believers. He stood there and approved of it. And there's another verses that talk about him going, getting, getting kind of like warrants to go, go ahead and uh, persecute Christians. And the Bible teaches that uh, um, chapter 9 of Acts says, but Saul, verse 1, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. That was his, his, his way. And now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you're to do. And you have the rest of the story there. He, he was to go see Ananias. This Ananias, Ananias was told by, by the Lord. Uh, the Ananias was worried that, you know, this is the guy that's persecuting and killing the Christians. And it says in verse uh, 15, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is my chosen instrument of mine. He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles 
and kings and the children of Israel. So God had saved him from this person murdering Christians to, to one who was going to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. And in Acts 26, Paul is telling the story again. He says uh, that he was told by the Lord, Arise, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. This is very important. Jesus, when Paul is, is recounting the story, he's saying that Jesus said to him, I'm going to yet reveal things to you. Not only what you've already seen in my miracles among the people, but I'm going to re yet reveal things to you. He said, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I will now send you. Another thing to remember about Paul is that he didn't go to a Bible college or didn't talk to the other apostles and, and glean from them, but he made it clear that he was receiving the revelation from Jesus Christ himself. And I think this is key to, to believing because to, today there's a lot of people that will try to separate the apostle Paul from the rest of the, the, the Bible. They'll try to separate him from Jesus or the teachings of Jesus. They'll say, well, Paul had all these different opinions about different things that are, you know, maybe issues today. But Paul made it clear that what he was, what he was doing was giving the revelation that was given to him by Jesus. In, in Galatians chapter 1, he said, verse 11 says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. That's key. He was not taught it by somebody else, by the other apostles. It says, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So just kind of setting the stage, here's this man converted. He says, I'm going to make you reveal things to you. I'm going to make you an apostle to the Gentiles. And, I'm going to, and all that he was given was received by revelation of Jesus Christ. So as we look at the letters of Paul, one of the things I want to make sure that we understand is that there's sometimes when Paul uh, begins to say something and he talks about it either being a mystery or receiving it from the Lord or, or, or sharing some new revelation that has not been revealed yet. And we call that a major revelation and they're throughout the, the scripture. So I wanted to, to kind of highlight some of those things because... I think that's important to understanding the flow of the revelation that came through the Apostle Paul. In his missionary journeys after he was saved on that conversion, he, was, uh, he went home to Tarsus for five years. Uh, his first journey was 47 and 48. Um, and that was uh, mostly to the cities in Galatia. And a lot of people believe he wrote Galatians as the first book uh, that he wrote, the first letter that he wrote. His second journey was in 50 to 52. He went, uh, included half, one and a half years in Corinth. And his third journey was 53 to 56, including two and a half years at Ephesus. In Colossians 4, the practice is shown that Paul wanted what he wrote, what had been revealed to him, to be revealed, to be read to the other churches. And uh, he says in Colossians, this is one of the later uh, letters that he wrote, he says, Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And the New American Standard kind of has a better, seemingly a better translation of that. Uh, by the way, most of my quotations are from the English Standard Version. Sometimes I'll go to the New King James or something else. But uh, in, the, in the New American Standard, it says, And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. That's kind of more of uh, what it meant, that there's a letter that was being circulated, and many people believe that was the, the book we call Ephesians. Well, I won't get too far into that now, but right to understand that he meant that, that all these letters to be read in the churches as... Uh, because of the importance of the revelations that was in him. And so just to establish the foundation 
revealing by Jesus Christ. God chose Paul to reveal these things to him and told him he's going to reveal things to him and give, be, make an apostle to the Gentiles. And then when Paul wrote, he said, I want you to read this in the churches so that we have that practice today in the churches that we read uh, the letters of Paul. Now just to understand another thing about this that I think is, is good to set the stage is that the way we have the Bible set up, it's kind of... Uh, um, it's organized in the longer, the longer books, the longer letters are first, and then the shorter letters come toward the end. So that Philemon, the shortest one, is the last one. But it's not necessarily in that order chrono by chronology, meaning that um, the things that are, that, are, that are written in the first books, for instance, many men believe that the first book written was Galatians. Um, the foundation that is in Galatians and the foundation of the things written in the, the letters to the Thessalonians about the rapture and the, and, the, and the Antichrist and things like that and then the things in Corinthians about the resurrection and, uh, and different, different things that are revealed throughout till finally you get to the final the, uh, the shorter letters of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians which he actually wrote from a prison He's already re always referring back to the things that they, he would assume they would have already known in these other letters. So that's, that's one of the things that I think is, uh, is key in understanding the progression of how God revealed the gospel to Paul. And so we're going we're gonna to be looking at that, but we're going to do it in the order that the, the scripture is set up. And uh, we'll go to first to Romans, which was written in 57. 58, around 57 or 58 AD. And the purpose of Romans uh, was to present a complete and detailed statement of the gospel. In Romans chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, he says, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Actually, there's a little more to it than that I'd like to read. Romans 1. He says, um, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you who also are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So, He's saying in the gospel, the righteousness is, of God is revealed. So that's the basic uh, um, uh, purpose of Romans to, was to present the full gospel message. And, and I haven't uh, outlined these books because there's a lot to that. It would take a long time. But uh, I wanted to kind of get some of the main themes and some of the key verses and uh, to kind of go from that. There's obviously a lot more in each thing that we could talk about. But the major theme of Romans is justification before God is by faith in Jesus Christ, apart from the requirements of the Mosaic Law. That is the major theme of, uh, of Romans, is that there's justification that is not by works. And some of the key verses connected to that are in Romans chapter 3 and verses 21 to 24, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned. We, we've heard this, this verse. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The beautiful gospel message that there's, we are justified freely by trusting in the righteousness of God. And uh, that, is, that is dealt with throughout the first uh, eight chapters of, uh, of Romans and kind of ending up with this concluding statement about that in, in uh, Romans 8.1. There's therefore now no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of, sp law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And there's a lot more we could read there, but uh, for the sake of time, I won't. <laughs> but uh, we get to that, that, main, uh, that main theme throughout. And then Romans 9 through 11 is a, is a, is a, is a um, talks about the Jewish people and their role and how we are brought into the, the faith that has been brought down through the people of Israel and some things about the future of Israel. Then in Romans 12, we have uh, the, the calling to, uh, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And then there's a lot of instruction to the churches there. There's, there's different things about uh, being subject to rulers, uh, about our conduct, about not being a stumbling block, and, and a lot of different things that uh, go out to the latter part of the, the book of Romans. But one of the things that's a major revelation one of the things that I would say is is the key thing to understand about Romans as as a book that's been written is that this idea of imputed righteousness and we kind of read some things about that but he wrapped in Romans 5 he says therefore it's through one man's offense talking about Adam sinning in the garden of Eden, Eden judgment came to all men resulting in condemnation even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. So that's a great revelation that we can trust in the righteousness of, of Christ for our salvation. And I don't think it was, had been spelled out that clearly to that point. Another major revelation is that the Holy Spirit indwells and enables believers. It, it says in Romans 8 and 9, You who, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone do, who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. And then later on in verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So he's saying, okay, the Spirit of God, if the Spirit of God, if you've trusted in Christ, the Spirit of God dwells in you. And he, you don't belong to Christ unless you have that Spirit dwelling in you. And not only that, is that, that the Holy Spirit is what enables us to live and put to death the, the, the deeds of the body and the flesh. And he says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So that, that's a major revelation that the work of the Holy Spirit is not just convicting, but when Jesus had, had said a long time before, he had promised the disciples, he says, he will dwell with you and shall be in you. Paul expands on that and says, not only that, is that that's what's going to enable you to live this life. By the Spirit, you can put to death the deeds of the body. And I, I, I see that as a major revelation that God gave Paul, that the Spirit of God is what gives us that power to live the life that he's called us to. Another major revelation that I don't think had been uh, to that time is uh, maybe seemingly, uh, I can slide by it a little bit, but <laughs> it says the, that the Holy Spirit intercedes for believers to God. It says in verse 26 of chapter 8, The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we did not, do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. These are powerful revelations. I don't believe that... Uh, this had been spelled out to this degree that the Holy Spirit actually intercedes on our behalf as believers to God according to God's will. And so the more we have the Spirit interceding for, the more we have the Spirit in our life and He, he helps us pray and helps us pray for the right things. And uh, 
That's a, I suppose we could talk all day about that. <laughs> I see that as a, a key revelation there. Some of the leadership elements um, in the book of Romans. Now, as I said before, there's a lot of instructions to the church. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things um, that are, um, are, you know, talked about. There's a lot of um, things for believers in general. What I wanted to kind of point out when I have this section on leadership in each book is talk, to talk about what Paul exemplified and kind of what he told the leadership or the, the stronger believers to do. So it's, you know, there's obviously a lot more things in here that, that, that speak to our Christian life. But uh, this is something where uh, I want to point out some of the things where, where Paul exemplifies what we should be like as leaders. And so in Romans 1, 9 to 12, you see the first one, and uh, it says, For God is my witness, verse 9, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. So he's saying, I mention you always in my prayer. I'm pr always praying for you. And this is the reason he's praying. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So his prayer, he says, I always mention you when I pray for you. I want to see you, not because I, I like the way you look or the like, <laughs> you know, I like hanging out with you. He says, I want to give you some spiritual gift. I want to encourage you. I want to give you something in the spirit. That's my purpose in wanting to see you. And I think that's a good example of how we should be about people in our life. What can I give them in the spirit? And then to be mutually encouraged. So he goes and says, not only that I will encourage you, but when I see your faith and your love for the Lord, I'll be encouraged by that. He says that in several books. So he's being encouraged by them. He's encouraging to them, wanting to, wanting to give them a spiritual gift when he sees them. And he always makes mention of them in his prayers. So some of the directives he gives to people... Um, is to bear with the weak. And in chapter 14 and 15, it's all about this. Um, chapter 14 starts out, it says, As for the one who is weak in the faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. And it goes on to, 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 to be, uh, not to strive, but to support him and to help him. And then he says in verse, chapter 15, verse 1, we, are, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So that, that's, the, that's the leadership directive. He says that the weak, you who are strong, welcome that person weak in faith that's struggling. Not, not to go and quarrel and, and set him straight, but to welcome him and bring him in and be gentle to him to bear with his failings and not just make ourselves happy. Oh, I sure told him what was the truth, what was right, what was wrong. But we bear with those, the, the person for their benefit. We do the thing for their benefit. There's another scripture in, uh, in 2 Timothy 2.22. It says, The servant of the Lord must not strive with men, but be gentle, able to teach, patient, and so on. So there's a there's a... There's a directive here to bear with the, the person that's failing, not to please ourselves and, and you know, feel like we're better than them, but to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. Obviously, all of these things can be sermons <laughs> in their own little right, so I don't want to spend too long on them, but this, some of the things from Romans... Another thing he told them was to strive with him in prayer. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. 
So he's just saying, you know, what I'm doing, I want, I want you to join with me so that it's acceptable, so that people will be responding to it, and uh, that there'll be safety, things like this. So he's, he's, he's showing that unity that we have as believers, that we're trying all for the same thing, and he's including them. He says, strive together with me, for me, in prayer. And I think that that's, again, a good uh, a leadership thing to ask. And say, you know, I need your prayer. I need your help. And I want to be doing this so that the gospel is acceptable to the people. In chapter 16, 17, uh, verse 17 says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. Avoid the contrary doctrine to what Paul was given. And we'll see more of this in Galatians in a, in a little bit here. But this, this was a common theme throughout Paul's ministry. And he says, be careful of those who, who cause divisions and bring things in a way that would be contrary to what I've given you, to what I've taught you, what I, what I got from the Lord and gave to you. Make sure nobody brings anything contrary to that. So that's, that was Romans.